Really fine. Um, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Alexia Jordan. I am the Innovation uh, Cyber and National Security Policy Analyst for the Lincoln Network. Um, thank you all for coming and I'm really excited to discuss the future of drone policy today. Um, this is an event that's a bit of a precursor for our annual conference that we have at the Lincoln Network. It's called Reboot and this year it's obviously Reboot 2020 um, and we're going to be bringing together the biggest names in technology and politics and finance to discuss the future of tech in the United States. This year is gonna be virtual and it's gonna last for three days, um, uh, starting on November 6th, going on to November 9th and November 10th. Um, please head over to rebootconference.org to register. Um, today, I am really, really excited. We have two of the best in the game regarding drone aviation policy. I'm gonna start uh, by introducing them first and then we can dive right in. Um, Brent Skoroff is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He knows quite a bit about transportation tech, telecommunication, aviation policy. Um, he currently serves on the FCC's Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee and on uh, the Texas Department of Transportation's Connected and Autonomous Vehicle Task Force. He is a member of the Federalist Society's Regulate, Regulatory Transparency Project um, and a host of other things that this man has a lot of time in the day to do. It's amazing. Um, so this is definitely the guy we want to listen to on drone policy because tons of people have cited his work. The White House, the Illinois Supreme Court, law journals, economic journals, the FCC. I mean, he's been summer everywhere. Um, so very, very happy to have you here, Brent. Um, our second panelist is absolutely no showstopper, um, is no short stopper himself. <laughs> he is the former FAA chief counsel and one of the architects of the regulatory framework for commercial drone usage that we have today. Um, before joining the FAA, Reggie Govan um, is his name. I didn't even say your name. Here I am. Reggie Govan is the former FAA chief counsel. And before joining FAA, he had spent more than 30 years as um, corporate counsel. Um, he was counsel to the US Senate, uh, the US House, and he has been on the cutting edge of aviation technology for quite some time. And I am super, super excited to have him here. Um, so for the audience, I do have questions for the panelists, but I want you all to interrupt me and interrupt our conversation and insert questions of your own. We definitely don't want um, you all to just kind of be sitting on the sidelines if you have things that you want to ask. So please just drop your questions in the chat and they'll be directly added to the conversation. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with a quick overview of this. So my objective for this talk is to give a public an understanding of drone policy. I want everyone to understand the distinction between military drones, private use drones, commercial drones. Um, and I'd like to touch on just a couple of the issues that drone policy brings up regarding data usage, privacy, national security concerns, how you manage traffic in the sky. Are we gonna manage traffic in the sky? Like, What is this supposed to look like? Um, so I'm gonna start off with a question for both of you. Um, a real quick bullet points. If you all could give two bullet points of why you think increased drone usage is the absolute best for society. These, these two reasons are exactly why we should have more drones in the sky, we should increase production, and two of your strongest concerns with the increased usage of drone policy, in, increased drone usage. Reggie, feel free to start if you like. The, the benefits are long-term. Um, like most technological transformation. Uh, ultimately, we will see significant economic growth and increased productivity. Um, and I think one of the byproducts of this particular transformation for drones and aviation or mobility generally is the transition from fossil fuels to electronic, to electric, and then ultimately some people are beginning to talk about hydrogen, but uh, zero emission, um, propulsion systems. So those are three very long-term benefits. Mm, excellent point, excellent point. Uh, Brent? Yeah, on, on the pro side, um, yeah, as, as Reggie said, the, the economic benefits of, of a transformative technology and, and 
you know, another way of looking at this is, as I see it, low altitude airspace as an asset class, as, as an underdeveloped asset, often a public resource. I, I, I see it as similar to uh, petroleum prior to 1850 or radio spectrum prior to 1920. It's, it's this underutilized or unused asset, but now we have the technology to actually use it. And, and much like petroleum uh, in the years after and, and, and radio spectrum in, in, in the years after, it will create uh, a lot of jobs and services that, that we, can, we can't even predict. I mean, we, we have some rough idea, uh, uh, which, which I guess brings me to, to the next, next point. Um, some of the social benefits from these services and, and medical, medical del delivery is an obvious one. And, and where you see drone pilot programs throughout the world, you often have medical applications. And, and there's a few reasons for that. One, just the public will probably accept medical deliveries more than uh, you know just going in with say Amazon deliveries. But medical also, it, you, these are small packages, they're lightweight, but they're also very valuable and, and often life-saving. So there, there's a better economic case and a business case. Uh, and so those two things, low outside airspace as an asset class and, and just opening up a, a whole new resource for, for jobs and services, and then and then some of the medical uh, services that, that I think we'll see. On the concern side, uh, my concerns are two, twofold. One is that I think the tech industry generally has um, done itself a slight disservice by not being um, more forthcoming about the very significant technology research and development challenges. Uh, and all too often, the default criticism about the pace of the realization of the full benefits of the drone economy um, have been that the federal regulatory structure is too slow, it's mired in bureaucracy, if only they would in, uh, establish the proper regulatory regime, we'd be off to the races. And I think that really oversells the, the current state of R&D and the very significant work that still needs to be done in order to perfect these technologies so that we can operate them at scale so that businesses can actually um, make profits. The other is I think that the there is a criticism of the federal regulatory structure and it's simply that relying on the default, which is the FAA only, a federal only regulatory structure for the new autonomy uh, infrastructure, the economy, um, is not going to work. It's simply inappropriate to the task, and we need to develop a, a new regulatory framework that very significantly involves state, local, and tribal governments. Yeah, and, and Reggie covered. Yeah, I, I share those those same commercial on the commercial side. Uh, I share those concerns. Um, uh, you know, my, I would just highlight concerns on the non-commercial side, which are military use of drones, um, and and domestic surveillance. Uh, you know, when when it becomes easier to do and cheaper to do surveillance, I think we've seen throughout history that governments around the world will. We'll, uh, we'll use those tools, um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure we've thought through um, some of the military and, and surveillance uh, ramifications from that. Uh, but on the, on the commercial side, yeah, I, I think Reggie put it well. I'm really glad that you brought that up, um, because I do think that those are some of the concerns that we're hearing a lot out of tech manufacturers and um, you know the innovators that kind of want to get going. Um, in the states, like they're just the federal government is slow. You guys are annoying, and you're not helping us. But at the same time, we kind of lack a, any type of like state guidance. Um, Brent, I know you created a very, very interesting 50 state scorecard on drone policy. Um, I'm wondering if you would like to talk just a little bit more about that, so you can help people understand where the nation. So Reggie just gave us just a little bit about where the nation is with federal drone policy. If you could talk just a little bit about your research to help us understand where different states are on film policy, and specifically if you could talk about some of the things that you guys hit on and, and scored states off of um, on your on your scorecard, specifically airspace lease laws and navigation easement laws. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I could talk for, for for hours about about my research, but I'll, I'll try to try to be succinct. Uh, 
so there, there, there is a, a common view, and frankly, I, I, I had this view for a while that aviation is a is dominated by federal regulation and federal policy, and and states and cities don't don't have much, uh, much role to play. Um, as I, as I looked at the law, and the policy, and thought through some of the pragmatic uh, issues that drones raise, I, I've come around, and, and it, it's my view, and and many others. Uh, who, who are looking into this, um, including uh, 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 the GAO had a report last month about, about this very issue about drone federalism and what will the breakdown be between federal and state regulation. I, I've come around to the view that states and localities and, and private property owners will will have a say about uh, drone aviation uh, when it when it when it when when drones are in what's you know surface airspace, low altitude airspace. Uh, you you run into state, local, and, and private property issues that I think uh, there, there's no getting around it. And so I, I, we, we put out this report in the spring, as, as, you, as you noted, uh, Connor Hayland, my research associate, and I. And, and we, we put this out. Uh, for one, many states have, have not done too much in the drone space. And I, I think for many states, they also have this view that this is a federal issue. It's not really our issue. And, and I, I think whether they want it or not, this will become their issue, uh, state and, lo and local, local issue. Um, so we're, we're trying to, with the report, um, raise some of the issues that we anticipate will be popping up, um, things like trespass, nuisance, privacy issues, and also property rights issues. And, and yeah, I'll just close with... Um, you, know, you mentioned we, we talk about this airspace leasing policy and, and and this in my view is a way of for states cities and the FAA to avoid uh, the inevitable lawsuits with trespass nuisance and takings would be to lease airspace above public roads and public right of ways uh, cities and states and counties often own this airspace and in many states I think about 21 by our count have airspace leasing laws on the books. They can do airspace leasing. Uh, this is this is done in traditional real estate. Uh, you know, building a high rise above a highway, for instance. Uh, but but these laws would would apply equally to to drone airspace leasing, and and we would like to raise the profile of these issues at the state level. And hopefully, our report card and and I'm I'm working on a paper on this. We'll we'll do that. I, I I definitely think that it did that. Um, I had a very good time reading it, but I'm also you know pretty nerdy, so like it is what it is. Um, it is. I so, yeah, a small <laughs> small sample of people for sure. Can I say that um, it, Brent's work is very detailed and very thorough. It does raise some policy related questions and issues that have yet to be explored and developed. Um, one of which is simply the potential distraction from having drone operations at low altitude immediately above uh, our road networks or our highways. Um, and the real question is, what's the role of state and local government versus federal government in working through those types of issues? We clearly need more research. There's, there are a couple of initial studies about distraction, just like there are a couple of initial studies about the energy efficiency of electric engines and drones today compared to um, fossil fuels. And the early results are contrary to what we would expect, but that, that's because we're simply at the first stage, the first inning of developing these new technologies, just like we may be at the first inning of developing this new regulatory framework using drone uh, public right of ways that state and local governments already have over public roads. Yeah, um, I think that reading reading just general reports um, on drone policy in the U.S., different state reports, mainly um, the one that the ones that came out of Mercatus, but then also looking at uh, drone policy and kind of how they're thinking about this in uh, Europe and the EU, um, the host of problems that state and local officials are going to have to deal with are, are just going to be insane. And I kind of pair that. I come from a government background and I kind of pair that with the thought of the fact that elections for some people are every two or four years. Um, and when you think about the type of longevity thinking that it's going to require to get some of these policies hammered down, you know, it definitely um, 
you know, is worrisome and, and it's going to require a lot of research for people to refer to when they get in office and then they have to like make these decisions and make these choices. Right. One of the um, premises of a hostility to having a state and local tribal governmental role in drone regulation yeah, what is, is the notion that it would result in a patchwork of, of regulations that would mm. significantly impede um, interstate commerce or intra commerce generally, whether interstate or intrastate. Um, I don't think that there's any validity ultimately to that objection. Uh, and the reason I say that is twofold. First, if you think about the experience to date with respect to autonomous vehicles, uh, state and local governments have been at the forefront of supporting very robust testing, research and development, both um, in dedicated um, space, but also on public roadways. Mm -hmm. And there is simply no evidence that state and local governments are hostile to this new technology or to any new technology that promises significant benefits to the citizens and promises to be an engine of economic growth uh, within the communities in which those businesses are located. So simply using the autonomous vehicle model um, suggests that this patchwork quilt fear is simply um, exaggerated, if not um, implausible and invalid. Uh, secondly, it seems to me that the very nature of commercial drone delivery is to use low altitude airspace, which is the exact opposite paradigm of what we have today in aviation, which is we have a few dedicated uh, corridors of airspace in low altitude that are designed to get very heavy aircraft to the upper atmosphere. Commercial drone operations are by design going to occur very close to the ground. And it seems to me that there's such a um, myriad of interests to be adjudicated and resolved that in our federal structure, state and local government and tribal governments are exactly the form in which those interests ought to be adjudicated. Uh, both in the names of commercial operations and privacy, but also adjudicating property rights. Um, so I, I think that the opposition is flawed on several counts, uh, and hopefully my friends in the industry will eventually come around and realize that they have to engage with state, local, and tribal governments on drone policy in the same way that they have to engage with respect to um, air taxis. You guys just got uh, a couple of really good questions um, in the chat. Um, I'll start in order. Uh, one uh, says, um, this is for Reggie. Um, as one of the early architects of the UA UAS IPP, one of its objectives was to test and evaluate various models of state, local, and tribal government involvement um, in the development and enforcement of federal regulations for UAS operations. So do you believe that IPP provided new clarity on this issue, or do you think that IPP dropped the ball? <laughs> well, it sounds like a setup question. Uh, it is true that I was very supportive of the IPP. I actually published a column um, supporting the Trump administration's initiative. I thought it was exactly the right thing to do. I think it quickly became overwhelmed by the magnitude of the task at hand. And secondly, there were some institutional constraints and political considerations so that we started with a IPP of 10 and it was designed to stay at 10 when I think what really needed to happen is we had to go from 10 to 50 to 100 so that after three years, we would develop a robust, robust uh, body of experience with sensors, with traffic management systems, with operating in different weather conditions and different flight operation, concepts of operations and the like. And that the promise was never realized. And one of the things that didn't happen, I don't believe, is that I don't think we got a very good understanding of while state and local governments collaborated with industry in order to put on these, I think it's eight IPPs, at the end of the day, I don't think we got much understanding about and learning that we can use to develop future regulations and that's particularly true with respect to the state, local, and tribal role for drone regulation. That is an underdeveloped area throughout the last three years of the IPP. 
Understood. Um, so we are now getting lightly flooded, which is really exciting because they think that we are not as nerdy as we are. They actually think we're interesting. So this is like awesome. Um, so first question, um, Reggie, could you tell us the operation? Um, oops, I moved. Um, operation of autos is a state re is state regulated like uh, regulation of automobiles is state regulated today. Why is state regulation of drone operations more onerous? Um, I know you spoke a little bit about how um, some people like from the federal side are just kind of like antsy about working with the state, but um, actually Brent, you might be able to speak to this too. Why are some states resisting, you know, regulating this when they already do other types of automobiles? Yeah, uh, so in, in my talks with, with uh, state regulators, so there's a few things going on. Um, they, you know, state governments, I, I think, have more financial constraints than, than say, the federal government. They, you know, state departments of aviation uh, have, have uh, you know, they, they have what they do, and, and this is a whole new and, and, frankly, a big thing that they just don't have the personnel or experience yeah. to really do. And, and there's another thing, which which is they, they in my in my conversations with with some some in industry and and some state regulators, they're being told uh, by by others in industry or perhaps uh, advisors, you know, government advisors, this is a federal issue, um, you know, stay out of it basically. Mm -hmm. And and as I said, I I think it's inevitable. This whether they want it or not, this will be in their laps in in the next few years and. You know, if, if you, as these programs expand, which I hope they will, if you have a complaint about drone flying overhead or one in your yard or, or something else, the FAA isn't really going to help you. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a local issue. If, if you have a nuisance problem uh, or, or damage to your property, uh, I, I, think, I think, you know, for instance, in Ohio, I think there are three FAA employees doing drone drone enforcement policy for the whole state. And, and FAA also has a, a lot on its plate. It's not just drones, obviously. Um, and so I, I think that's what's going on at the state level. Either they believe or they're being told that this is a federal issue, stay out of it. And, and my view is this, this will become their problem very soon, whether they want it or not. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I come from state government and I didn't even think about, I was kind of thinking about it from the perspective of an elected official whereby like they just have a lot on their plate and this is just hard and, you know, it's very technical, but I didn't think about, you know, the maybe misleading influence that might be coming from industry trying to, you know, keep them from being regulated. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely something that I'm, I'm sure is, 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 clouding this clouding this scenario um, yeah and, and i i want to have i don't think it's you know i think it's well intentioned i i, I uh but i i think they're not uh telling the full picture and, and they might not be aware of all these issues that are coming down the pike mm -hmm. makes sense um we have another question um it touches a bit on what you just spoke about brent um, a participant asks, what are the insurance ramifications of drones losing packages, damaging packages, property, or harming a person? And um, I read in an FAA report and also um, in another private report, I don't think this one came from you, Brent, but it did talk about um, adding in the insurance component uh, to policy regulations for commercial drone usage versus private drone usage. Um, so if you guys, either of you all have any comments on where that is. Um, I'd love to hear it. Also, this person would too. So th there are several areas of regulation today that are quintessential state government functions. Uh, with respect to aviation, one of them is the siting of airports, the takeoff and landing of aircraft at airports. That's state and local government. It's only after those decisions are made that the FAA, quote, gets involved. It's a, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it is a state and local governmental power. And the same thing is going to be true with respect to drones, except drones can take off and land from everybody's backyard. So there is necessarily going to be a role for state and local governments. 
The other quintessential state and local lo, state governmental function is insurance regulation. Uh, and that's true today. And just as states set minimum insurance requirements for you and I as operators of automobiles, it seems to fit that state and local governments would be setting insurance requirements for operating drones, whether it's for commercial or private slash pleasure use. Uh, it is simply a state governmental function because it's so related to the protection of property and people. Now, with respect to aviation, the federal statute does give to the FAA one of its statutory missions is the protection of people and property on the ground as a result of the flight, which means the plane is not going to fall out of the sky and harm and injure passengers on the plane or property on the ground. But that's that's related to the safety of flight. Here we're talking about just general insurance requirements for the operator. And it seems to me that there's no reason why a state wouldn't have that authority. Um, the other thing I want to say about state and local governments unrelated to insurance is state and local governments today set all the rules of the road for the operation of the automobile. The only thing the federal government does is set the safety requirements for the design and manufacture of the automobile. And once it complies with those safety requirements, the operation of that automobile is purely a state function, state and local governmental function. And so if you envision the drone economy as creating in low altitude airspace that which exists on the roadway for cars, it necessarily should be a state and local governmental function. Yeah, I, I would just add briefly, I mean, Reggie covered it well. Um, you know, and I, a proposal I've become fond of and have promoted are states creating these drone advisory task forces, um, which a few states have, but it, it is because there are a lot of these state and local issues, uh, not, not just on the operations side, but things like liability insurance, which I know some insurance companies actually are creating new products, insurance products for, for drone companies and, and, and drone hobbyists. So we're seeing that, but I, I think drone advisory committees uh, are a good thing because this is new for all of us and just to get lawmakers uh, and, and policymakers at state and local level informed about some of these emerging issues, whether it's insurance or navigation easements, or airspace leasing, or um, you know, expanding Department of Aviation's capabilities or personnel. Um, so I definitely wanted to take this conversation in a slightly different direction, but you guys are getting a mass of questions on these details between the intricacies between uh, state versus federal regulation. I'm sure you guys see them all in the chat. So I will just go ahead and jump in. Um, so one of our participants is asking about um, drone highways over public roadways. Um, and they're saying that drones today tend to be slower in flight than stable, normal highway traffic flows um, on the ground. So do you guys think that the UAS transit speeds will need to like increase to make this work um, in metropolitan areas? I think he's just trying to figure out um, what type of uniformity at all, uh, or if this has been thought about at all on the federal um, level or by drone policy analysts about the uniformity of how drones are made and which ones you know, are gonna be allowed to be used in public spaces. So Brent, you know, when you talked about the positive externalities of drone usage, you were like, you know, medical deliveries, um, commercial deliveries, these types of things. But, you know, I think this question hits a bit towards, are we going to have any type of say of where they get these drones from and, you know, what the minimum requirements for their existence are so that they all kind of fly on the same path? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A, a few thoughts. You know about operation operationalizing the drone highway idea, which is being discussed. Maybe, maybe, uh, you know the airspace leasing idea is, is somewhat unique, but the drone highway idea is is you hear it all around the world um, because you know, at least in the medium term, it will be these dedicated corridors where, where drones will operate for a lot of reasons. Um, so the the world I envision and that that I, I hope to encourage would be one where and in my background is telecommunications, so some of this is coming from, from that background. But I, I think there are some analogs where the FCC certifies devices um, 
and they have oversight over interstate communications. And you can you can see the analogs for drone policy, where the FAA maintains its role as certif certifying devices, perhaps, or, or drones, certifying UTM, these unmanned traffic management systems, basically air traffic control for, for drones, um, you know, separation minimums between drones, you know, that, seems like a good thing for the FAA to take up emergency landing procedures, that sort of thing. But then the, the time, place, and manner restrictions would be at the state and local level. Um, and, and so the FAA would essentially whitelist regions in a state where there's just de minimis uh, risk to manned aircraft or, or airports uh, and states would would manage the airspace, the low altitude airspace there. Um, and so that, that's the world where I see this going. I think we're slowly moving that way as it is, but yeah, I hope I hope we can accelerate it. Okay. Um, another question we have uh, from the group. Um, traditionally, each locality or city manager, whoever that might be, of road traffic, um, um, Traditionally, each locality or city managers of road traffic within their boundaries, um, you know, just kind of this is this is what they do. Um, as cities begin to manage traffic policies through API, are the mechanics of city airspace management similar enough to be managed with the same tools? This question was for both of you all. So if either one of you feel more comfortable answering this question about APIs and UTM, um, I mean, traffic management, please feel free. Just, just briefly, I, you know, the, the analog with road traffic, um, you know, in some ways it's similar, in some ways it's different. The, the reality is, the road network is chaotic and dangerous. You know, we have thirty-five thousand deaths on the roads every year. It's, and and for a lot of reasons, the public and it, regulators just won't tolerate that sort of thing um, in in aviation. So I, I see it being. Uh, much more of this defined corridor, many fewer parties involved. Um, and, and uh, yeah, on, on the API thing, I, I see UTM, um, I see it working much like telecommunications, wireless telecommunications, where there, there'll probably be a, a few, uh, a handful of, of uh, UTM providers who have just very good technology that that will be deployed at a local level, much like cell towers are, are deployed at, at a local level. Um, and that's that's the model I see, uh, but you know, it, it's hard to say how that will shake out. I, 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 I think at core that question is maybe asking to, to what extent are the technology issues that the drone that have to be resolved to realize the benefits of the drone economy are similar to the technology issues for autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think they are similar. We're talking about propulsion systems because we're going from gas to electric. We're talking about sensors, um, the robustness of the sensors, where the data that the sensor collects um, gets analyzed. Is it edge computing? Is it a computer on the vehicle? or does it go into a server? What's the degree of latency in the communication? Um, the, the materials that are being used, I think this, the questions are very similar. The applications may be different for automobiles versus um, drones, but I think the, the regulators who are dealing with the introduction of AVs are dealing, are having to grapple with some of the same technology issues and what the regulatory framework should be for evaluating and certifying those technologies, as is the FAA with respect to the drone industry today. Understood. Uh, we have um, two of the same questions, or like they're similar, um, which is really exciting because this is also one of my questions. So I guess it's, it's definitely on the top of people's minds. And the and the the overall topic of it is jurisdiction. Um, so you know we know that FAA and then later NASA kind of came in and and. Um, started trying to take away and, and lead on this drone policy issue, but other later other agencies had to hop in, um, commerce, transportation, um, different members of the IC, uh, you know, weighed in, DOJ, of course. Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on how 
um, federal leadership, uh, state leadership, um, whomever the next president may be, uh, could encourage um, faster uh, interagency or extra agency cooperation on cross-sectional issues um, like drone policy. Um, that same type of question can definitely be applied in terms of how are you guys gonna work through jurisdictional issues from the federal to the state level? Um, either one of you all, the question was posed to both of you all from the two participants. So whoever would like to answer can definitely feel free. So I'll start um, by acknowledging that the <clears throat> FAA stumbled around some of the security, the national security, the cybersecurity, um, not so much privacy, but the security related issues um, that arise from expanding drone operations. Michael Werchter has spoken about this on a number of panels and has acknowledged that the initial roadmaps that the FAA published were um, not sufficiently attentive to the many security related concerns. Uh, those days are over and the, the FAA and the security agencies are working hand in glove. The FAA has a very robust security line of business that has excellent leadership. And th those agencies work, work very cooperatively and collaboratively um, so that I don't believe any of the security related issues are not getting the appropriate attention um, or the desired resolution. It, it is an area in flux. Privacy was dealt with very early in the way we always deal with privacy with new technologies. We have a set of voluntary standards that get published. Uh, and with respect to the internet, we still haven't solved that privacy issue. California has gone out and done something analogous to the EU. But as a, as a, on the national level, we, we haven't, maybe we've solved the privacy issue by default, but for those who want to see a different privacy regulatory regime, we still haven't bit the bullet. Um, around cybersecurity and national security, there are several issues that are initiatives that are underway. One is the, the most uh, written about, and that is that the federal government is getting serious about the security related concerns with the uh, federal government, with governments generally, federal, state, and local governments um, using DJI Jones uh, for law enforcement operations. I think that's a a very legitimate, perfectly valid and, uh, set of concerns, an appropriate response. And I would hope that um, nobody questions the, the um, integrity or the validity of the assessments that the national, national security agencies have done in support of the prohibitions. I, I think they could actually go further. There is some federal legislation out there in the House and the Senate but that's, that's specific with respect to the country of origin of manufacture or the country in which data may be located. Um, there, there's a whole second, in 2018, Congress promulgated, uh, enacted a export control statute that now has federal agencies uh, reviewing for a whole variety of uh, autonomy, mobility technology as to for whether it's appropriate for that technology to be exported um, because of national security concerns. And essentially national security, I, as I understand it, is defined as economic security um, because you don't want any foreign nation becoming so dominant with respect to a critical technology that it affects our economic power and therefore erodes our national security interests. So a lot of work is presently being done uh, in the last two years with respect to the broad range of national security issues. Hey, man, from my end, um, <laughs> I could not possibly uh, agree with you more. Um, if you would, if either of you um, would like to speak to, um, you did just for a second, Reggie, but um, I definitely want to open this question up to Brent as well. Um, we know at a federal level, as you mentioned, DJI drone purchases are banned, um, which I personally agree with. Um, but when we think about how market share should be thought of as state legislators are taking on more responsibility uh, for this topic, um, you know, should 
we be viewing drone increased production from a geocompetitive lens, especially considering you have all of our people in Silicon Valley, you know, like yelling at state and federal government, like, hey guys, we just want to innovate, do better, speed up, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, we would, we still, do you guys think that we should be thinking about this from a geocompetitive lens? Um, and I also kind of want to add, um, if you all have ran into any state or local legislators who have thought about um, data storage for the drone companies that might be in their state and how data storage is its own separate, um, you know, privacy and security issue when it comes to the information that the drones collect. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, and, you know, the, the, the geopolitics that's you know, above, above my pay grade, but I, I do think, um, you know, in, in the DJI, you know, prohibition or, you know, the Department of the, the Interior, it, it, it wasn't as drastic as I think some of the news stories report. I mean, the, the Department of the Interior said, uh, essentially, we're, we're going to pause the use of DJI drones. We're going to assess what the security risks are, if any. Uh, but they, they noted that's only for the non-emergency services. They, they kind of said that in emergency search situations like wildfires, they, they might still use them, which, um, you know, says, says something about the quality of, you know, and the reliance on, on DJI drones. I, I, th I think DJI has been caught in these much larger geopolitical issues. Um, and, and drones are a big part of that. Uh, I, I had a research assistant last year who was fluent in, in Mandarin, and, and uh, we, we looked at the Chinese Civil Aviation Authority's documents and, and like good party members, they had these five-year plans for the drone industry, uh, but they, you know, China, or at least their, they, they view autonomous aviation, including drones, as, as a major pillar of the future economy, up there with 5G and AI. Uh, they, they view autonomous aviation up there. And so um, I think <clears throat> I think the restrictions have to be, yeah, I, I think DJI got caught in this crossfire um, that the US and the China have have these very bold visions about about who will who will own this own this space. And uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't know where we go from here, but uh, you know, it can't be you have to wait until there's a national security incident before you you act. Uh, but but also I, I think your concerns have to be grounded in 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 reality and and I hope that Department of Interior I hope that's a good faith assessment and, and that that they'll follow through on that. Yeah, I, I think we've gone beyond DO the Department of the Interior. Uh, the Department of Justice has just outright banned federal law enforcement agencies from using DJI drones for law enforcement purposes. And the legislation that's pending in the Congress, at least in one of the, the House or the Senate, would preclude state and local governments doing it to the extent that they're using federal funds to purchase the drone um, or drone purchase or operate the drone. I think that's perfectly appropriate. As I understand, it's grounded on a realistic assessment of our national security interests. Uh, and I, I'm not going to question that. Um, I, I will say that the FAA um, has weekly briefings from the National Intelligence Services on a range of national security related issues in aviation. So I have every reason to believe that any decision would be founded upon a realistic, honest assessment of the national security threats. Um, I will say, I, I do believe this is an area of, of exclusive national uh, regulation, and I don't believe it would be appropriate for the various states to be um, uh, independently coming to their own um, security uh, risk assessment. Uh, this is one where I think it's appropriate that we speak with a single voice as a country and that the federal government represent, determine what the national security interests are and how best to protect them. Understood, understood. Um, so uh, Brent, you kind of talked about how um, DJ might DJ might have just kind of gotten into the crossfire of this geopolitical war, and you know um, how you know we probably just want to be a little bit more um, cautious about how we you know like discuss this. Um, so building off of that, 
I'd like to ask uh, both of you, but I go ahead and start with Reggie um, about how it how uh, the FAA has collaborated with entities like CFIUS or um, NTIA in trying to uh, create policy around how different drone manufacturers or drone companies um, that are moving into the United States, selling to private citizens, um, how they should be regulated, um, if they should be regulated uh, more. Um, mm -hmm. Has there kind of been like an uptick in this and, and what uh, y'all at the FAA uh, did on that matter? Yeah, I, um, I, I believe that that's really covered by the Export Control and Reform Act of 2018 that I, ref that I spoke about a few minutes earlier. Um, I don't really have much to add about to that other than I do think the uh, with respect to privacy, the voluntary standards that the Department of Commerce had promulgated four or five years ago will, will probably need to be revisited um, with respect to drones, just like I think privacy regulation generally is going to have to be revisited across um, all these new and emerging technologies, because I don't know that the initial efforts uh, embodied in these voluntary standards are sufficiently robust to respond to the public's legitimate interests with respect to the privacy of some of their personal information. Understood. Um, we have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, this is for both Reggie and Brent. Um, do you think that the FAA will ever force a non-cooperative aircraft to participate um, in airspace control systems. It seems odd um, that, you know, he's required to turn on a signal for his car, uh, but people are flying in the national airspace without transponders and radios. Um, that was the question. And I think it just kind of gets uh, a little bit into the granularity of um, how requirements of drones are gonna be laid out um, per state. Um, Brent, if you wouldn't mind starting, uh, but of course, either one of you could jump in. Sorry, and the question was, how how will they require non-cooperative aircraft to do what? To participate in air airspace control systems. So I think uh, just kind of the nature of the question. Is, oh, I see. Oh, okay. okay so I, I, um, that's that seems to be the the way they want to head. If you look at the remote. ID proceeding, I mean, it's it's uh, pretty broad. They want you know, essentially all all drones to be connected and 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 to, so law enforcement and others can know what drones are in the air. Um, you know, my 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 own view. I, I think I think the corridor system, um, which which has its detractors, but I think the corridor system. Um, Mitigates a lot of the concerns about non-cooperative traffic. If if um, uh, if you have dedicated corridors and only you know approved drones can be be in those, then you've got large savvy operators who who are uh, who are you know cooperating with all the federal and, and state policies on that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an open question. I mean, there are a lot of questions about remote ID, UTM, what that looks like, whether whether a corridor system is permanent or just short term, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. My, my own view is uh, a lot of these problems are solved by by a corridor system and at low altitudes um, um, for the segregated air, airspace uh, framework. Yeah, I, I do think there's a technology question, and that is uh, today a pilot can take off. Um, without filing the appropriate um, flight plans with the FAA, or the air traffic control. Um, the real question technology is, will a drone be able to take off uh, without complying with whatever the equipage requirements are of the, for that aircraft in the FAA? Would it, be, would it have a kill switch? Would it not be able to enter the airspace without meeting whatever the requirements are for operating in that airspace uh, or in the corridor, as Brent said. That's a technology question. I think the, to go up one level, we've talked about cybersecurity, we talked about privacy, and so really at heart, the question's asking about counter UAS systems. 
And so I first want to say I'm on the advisory board of a Israeli company that manufactures these systems. Um, so first having made that disclosure, my own view is it, it's an area, as we know, the FAA is getting ready to do a second round of testing of these systems at airports and the like. I believe state and local governments could be testing these systems off of airport property. They have lots of critical infrastructure to protect uh, and their ability to assess the efficacy of these systems is outside of the airport environment is wholly unrelated to any FAA approvals or FAA R&D, test sites and et cetera. Um, but until we have effective counter UAS systems and clear concepts of operations as to who's going to make what decisions about what's non-compliant and what are the range of actions that could be taken, who the decision makers have to be. Um, that is an indispensable regulatory regime for realizing the full benefit of the drone economy. Um, remote ID is the first step, but we have to have some county UAS system beyond what federal law now provides. And the federal law that was enacted several years ago um, in lightning speed, for which the DOJ and the other federal agencies should be congratulated, but the county UAS authority is limited to five federal agencies. And, and that's simply inadequate if we are really envisioning drone operations around the country in every community um, and neighborhood in every county and state in this country. Okay, um, so thank you for all of you all's questions. Um, Reggie Brent, thank you all for um, staying, staying with us and answering um, all of these very uh, detailed uh, inquiries. I've, I've definitely enjoyed myself. Um, in the last like literal couple minutes that we want that uh, we have, I want to give you all the opportunity to um, speak about because both of you all have alluded to, um, you know, state government needs to step up, federal government needs to work more with state government. Um, we've talked about this, what I feel to be at length. Um, and I think a good closer for us might be um, if you all have any like last suggestions to the audience, um, any last suggestion to industry leaders out there, any last suggestions to um, state leaders out there that might be trying to figure out how to um, operationalize their, you know, their policies. Um, if you could, you know, just kind of wave a magic wand and allow states to uh, enforce different sandbox, you know, policy practices uh, between them at their own level so that um, you know, we can speak to uh, uh, the FAA's um, guidance regulations so that states can try these independent things that you spoke about um, earlier. If there's any type of sandbox regulation you'd like to see the federal and state um, engage in, what, what would it look like and um, how could everyone, you know, work together in the most harmonious way until we start finding things that work for all 50 states? Yeah, I, I'll go. Um, so, in that in that GAO report about drone federalism last month, it, it was it was revealed that USDOJ and USDOT are have a task force meeting to decide what what is federal was the U.S. policy about drones and, and states and, and what the role will be. Um, I I hope I hope they uh, I hope they're aware of of all these legal and and practical realities that that we've discussed. Um, you know, what I would like to see, you know, at the state level, I mean, you need, you need FAA's cooperation with this, obviously. I mean, this is, uh, aviation safety. You need to work with the FAA on this. Um, you know, states can't go off and, and, and start, start going on their own. Um, but what I would like to see them working together, the FAA, as I said, white listing regions where there's de minimis or no risk to manned aircraft. And then states saying to their uh, to U.S. come or you know any any drone operator, hey come come test your services. Uh, it's waitlisted by the FAA. Uh, come test. Come try to create a drone company, a drone services company, and and letting a thousand flowers bloom. You know, unfortunately, right now we we're, we're letting five flowers bloom, and and you know I hope we'll I hope we'll let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, and the other is I hope states will start standing up drone advisory committees. This is 
modeled much like the AV advisory committees, the autonomous vehicle committees that are out there because there are a lot of just novel issues about insurance, electrification, public perception that that uh, states will, will be better positioned, uh, but they but they first need to get stakeholders and, and experts together on this. So as a good Democrat, I'm not going to use the phrase, let a thousand flowers bloom. I, I will say that state and local government should be the laboratory of experimentation, um, both for industry and for government processes. Um, I, I think two things should happen. Uh, one is, those of you who are in industry and technology should be coming to state and local governments with your R&D that needs to be field tested. And secondly, state and local governments ought to be doing what New York and a handful of other states have done, I think Utah and others, that is create the biggest swath of airspace that you can. In New York, it's a 50 mile corridor. And together, the companies ought to be coming with the state and local governments. Forget about whether there's an IPP program in the next few years. Come to the FAA with your what needs to be field tested. How are you going to do it? What's the safety case for it to happen? And flood the FAA. And I'm, I'm not saying this because I have anything. I love the FAA. And I think Earl and others are doing a great job at the uh, UAS Integration Office. But the FAA is resource constrained. And so we need to bring to the FAA all the ideas that we know need to be worked through and vetted for which we need results in order to feed the next development of regulation. Because at the end of the day, expanded operations only happen with new regulation. Um, so A, I'd like to see industry um, stop with the shibboleth about the quilt, the patchwork quilt and state and local government animosity and hostility to technology and enter into true working collaborative cooperative relationships and bring them to the FAA. And then I'm sure that we will accelerate the pace of progress uh, and we will accelerate the development of the regulatory regime and authorizations necessary to realize the full potential of the drone economy. You guys both ended this on a fantastic note. I agree with what you all would say. Um, this just made me very happy. Um, thank you guys so much for coming on. We had a really engaging conversation. Um, everyone just kind of like stuck on to the end, which is just, it gives me so much hope for the future of drone policy in the US. Um, so thank you all. And thank you to all of the audience members. I hope everyone has a safe and productive day. And don't forget to join us for the rest of our reboot series. Um, you can check us out at rebootconference.org. See you guys.